You saw those Godfather movies, the ones with the dapper guys with the long coats, with the carnation in the lapel and the gun in the inside pocket. Well, that's the image that comes to our minds when we hear stories about the mob. And is it really like that? Meet Lou. Lou knows the ins and outs of the mafia. Why? His father and his uncle were an instrumental part of it. By the time Lou was 12 years old, he was aware that his father killed people for a living. Lou said it didn't matter, though. He was brought up not to ask questions, brought up to respect what his father did. What was it like growing up with someone like that? My father was a very hard man. He was, um, only had a third grade education. He came here with a family, had a large family, a lot of brothers and sisters, and he had to leave school in the third grade. So his knowledge, he was not a very bright man at all. And he constantly would teach me what his perception of honor and respect, to talk low, never to raise my voice, shake hands with everybody I meet. And then he would try to tell me about his life, and he was not very proud of it. And he would never entertain a question if I said to him, uh, what happened to this guy? He said he, he had to go. Go where, Dad? Where'd he go? St. Louis? <laughs> no, he's gone. That's he's gone. Just but how Lou, it was said. You're, you're 12 years old. You know, I don't want to put my own kids down, but if I told them that I was in the mafia, they'd go and show and tell. They'd tell kids at school. <laughs> what kept the kids, what kept you from, from saying something at 12? Fear. You were Fear. afraid of your father. Oh, sure. He, he uh, wanted to teach me how to fight. He had a couple of friends that were professional fighters. Uh, Johnny Saxon was the welterweight champ of the world. Kid Gavilan. Yes. They would come over to my house, and they would put on the gloves with me. Then I, they'd leave. I was, uh, I think, six years old, and I said, I, I, I wasn't interested. And he hit me and broke my nose and said to me, you're going to do what I tell you your to do. Your father broke your nose at six? Yeah. I raised my <coughs> voice to my sister, and I was in the bath bathroom taking a shower, and he said, tell Louie it's time to eat. And she called my name. I said, what? Three times. And just like the movie Psycho, the door opened, I seen him coming down on my head with the bat. And I put up my hand, and I took a shot in the elbow and uh, in the ribs. He said, if I told you, if anybody talks to a woman like that in front of you, what would you do? And I said, well, I, d I defend a woman. He says, well, then I'm defending your sister. Don't you ever talk like that again to her? So I was raised pretty strict that way. Wow. Um, at one point, you went to church. Yes. Your family went to church. Yes. Did Dad go to church? Just to give the priest a beating. Just to give the priest a beating? Yeah. Explain. I was making confirmation, and since my name started with the letter E, I was second row, first seat. Kids made a lot of noise in the back, and the uh, priest went to grab my chin, and he gave me a, a full five fingers across the face. And I went home, and my father looked at me and said, what happened to your face? And I said, is there nothing? Naturally, he said to me, sit down and tell me what nothing is. And I told him the whole story. I said, it, it wasn't me. It was people in the back, and they were making noise, and the priest said, uh, made an ex uh, me the exception to the rule and gave me a smack. He took me back to church, and before the corner, he says to me, I'm asking you one more time, is this true, or am I going to be told a different story? I said, it's true. He knocked on the door, and the priest was a, a tough priest. He was a knock-around guy from the neighborhood. He didn't take anything from any of the youth gangs that stayed there. And he came to the door, and he said, yeah, 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 I was wrong. I went to grab his face. Instead, I smacked his hand, and I hit him, and uh, just don't worry about it. And I never saw the punch come, and I seen the priest's teeth go flying. He beat him and kicked him under a car, and his people in the neighborhood had to pull him off him. He said, you can pray about Jesus Christ, but don't play him. He said, that's my son, and nobody hits him. So I was torn. I, you know, I respected that. He loved me no matter what. He just didn't know how to do it. He just didn't know how. And your uncle, another um, mafia person? Yeah, my uncle was an acting underboss in the Gambino crime family for a while. And uh, you never hear the man raise his voice, never hear him curse, and you never hear him disrespect anybody. He was very, very quiet. What happened to Unc? He was murdered in 1979. His son was involved in a Save the Children campaign and uh, took a pitch with uh, President Carter's wife, Rosalind Carter. And when they circled his picture and said that his father and him were made members of the Gambino crime family, the sentence was handed down and he knew it. And I had talked to him about it. I said, Uncle Jimmy, are you worried? He said, it's all over for us. And uh, I was picked, uh, I was the only cop alive with two Medal of Honors in New York City. I was in 11 gun battles. Yeah, the let's go back then. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt the story, but did you not have to tell your father? I, first of all, why do you want to be a cop? 
couldn't. My father was dead before I turned out to be a cop. I, he would never. Uh, he hated cops with a passion. Dad passed on. Uh, Why did you want to be a cop? I was a good kid. I never was in trouble. I played football for Erasmus Hall. I had scholarship offers. I played handball, baseball. I won my letters and everything. And I was a good kid. I was afraid. I was so afraid of my father, Sally. Now, he's dead 26 years. I'm still afraid of him. I'm still scared. You're still afraid of him. That's right. What form does that fear take? The, uh, there was two ways of doing things, his way and the wrong way. And I was very, very, uh, it's uh, tough for me to say it, but without his ruling on me the way he was, I don't know what I would have turned out to be. So you, did anyone in the family, there have got to be other mafia-connected relatives. When you said, I wanted to be a cop, didn't anyone take you aside and say, you didn't inherit that mantle? Oh, sure. They've all told me you're crazy. What do you know? What do you want to do that for? And you became a cop, and you're too modest to say you were the 10th best decorated cop yeah. in the NYPD. That's New York Police Department. Right. In 1983, I was taken into custody. I was on the papers, the headlines of all the channels. It said, Mob Big got data from cop. And they accused me of, uh, of giving information to Gambino people. They said they had papers with my fingerprints on them. They were made in the precinct where I worked. And uh, they started a campaign to uh, really get me. Who did? The New York Police Department? Yes. And I was out for six and a half months. And they waited for a judge that they, uh, was, had a reputation to be called a hanging judge in New York City. His name was Yumo. And they put my case before him. And then when he uh, read the files and the facts, he um, started the trial and told me it could lead to me going to jail for 15 to 20 years, et cetera. Because you're a policeman who's supplying info to the mob. Correct. Then the FBI agent stood up and said, uh, oops, it's not him. It's not him? It's not him. It's and not him? It's not him. It's not his fingerprints either. It's not being a little pregnant, you know? It's not. You are or you're not. <laughs> they weren't. And I was accused of having it done. And then the smear campaign started, you know, you and your kind, and I've dealt with uh, guineas before, and I said, that's not going to, that's... Who did that campaign? A couple of the internal affairs and, uh, divisions, you know, a couple of inspectors. One night, I asked them if they would shoot me up with sodium pentothal, I would take a detector test. I was uh, 16 years on a job, I never had a day out sick, and I was um, shot at, stabbed numerous but times. But people remembered your father and your uncle's connection, so when they're looking for somebody, there you are. Right. Okay. When the FBI said, whoops, a man's life is probably halfway ruined, did you go back to the police department? Yeah. I went back, and after the trial was over, the uh, trial commissioner says, when did the FBI I know that Louis Eppolito did not commit what they said he did? Right. And I have the documents that said 72 hours, yet they kept me out six and a half months with no pay or anything. But they knew 72 hours. Correct. They just didn't want to say Debbie, it Debbie, you may be pie. right not being thoroughly behind the police. All right. They put, they reinstated you? Yeah. Back pay? Back pay reinstated me, gave me a promotion to detective second grade. Uh-huh. And everything was fined. And every place I went, everywhere I go, they would always be scrutinizing my work after that. And the straw that broke the camel's back is there was an FBI agent on the scene of a double murder in Brooklyn in 1989. Two wise guys were found uh, dead in a car. And I went down there to help out. And one of the agents said to another FBI agent, he says, uh, why don't you get the super mafia cop over there and let him find out who did this. And the agent in charge says, don't ever embarrass that man by saying that to him. He doesn't deserve it. And I looked at my boss and I shook my head. I said, that's it. I packed it in. 21 and a half years. And I left. You just walked in and said, there's so many allegations. There's so the reputation. You know, I always say they retract on the 43rd page. They print on the first page. You just couldn't take that, and you went in and said goodbye. Yeah, there was, the reaction uh, when they took the re retraction in the newspaper. I got a call from a newspaper man. I can tell a very fast story. A, a young kid pulled a purse, 13 years old, and um, he knocked the woman down. And I chased him into an alleyway, and uh, he picked up a stick. And he was just a small little kid, and. Uh, I said, put that down, come out here. And he says to me, I, um, I have no food in my house, and my mother is, I have three other children, my mother lives alone, and I, I never did it before. So I went to the woman, I said, look, he thought you were his aunt, and it was a mistake, and he got scared, and he called us, and we got your pocketbook back. I took that kid home, and I went to this, it was a, it was a black family in, in Bedford-Stuyvesant, and I took the kid back, and I saw the kids had nothing to eat. So I called the other radio cars down, they put their hands in their pockets. They got out all the money that they could get. And we got her job, and we got the kids fed that night and everything. That woman went to the police commissioner, 
I said, how could you do that to that cop? You don't know, you only know him as a name. You don't know what he did in those streets. And part of the, my legend was that if he called me and you need help, I did it. I didn't say, I'll take care of it. You if did a, it. Yeah. If a woman came in and said, my husband's beating me up, I went to the husband and I said, hit her in front of me. I kind of like your way of, of policing. Uh, <laughs> What do you do now, Big Lou? Well, I've acted in nine movies. I've been in Goodfellas, State of Grace, Predator 2. I tried writing a screenplay. Gene Hackman has been really, like, great with me and uh, Mikhail Baryshnikov. And I did a movie with them called Company Business. And I wrote a screenplay, and it was bought by New Line Cinema. And I just finished a second screenplay that is Anthony Quinn... Is this better than policing? Oh, he's getting shot at any day. Yeah. <laughs> when we come back, we'll meet a man who grew up in a neighborhood full of monsters doesn't agree with our guest. Says these monsters are really not vicious people. Mobsters are not vicious monsters. He says the gangsters he knows are perfect gentlemen. All right, don't go away. <laughs> this is Bill. His great uncle was in the mob, and Bill said he grew up around the mafia. Bill says he resents those kind of stereotypes people have of organized crime. All right. Uh, you grew up, your great uncle was in the mob, grew up in Brooklyn. The mob was respected. They were perfect gentlemen. Says the Hollywood picture of the mob is the figment of a producer's imagination. Mobsters don't kill innocent people, just those who betray them. Those who get involved know the rules and have to suffer the consequences if they break them. And Debbie, very interesting. Mobsters don't tell their wives what personal criminal business they are into. They are really nice guys, eh, Bill? We've heard two stories here, and they're, they're really very nice. respectful toward their families. Very respectful, and uh, they uh, with the neighbors and all the. Perfect gentleman. Perfect gentleman. Believe okay, me. I'll let any of you who want to talk to Bill do that. Bill, you say there's a way you can tell if someone is a mobster. Well, f it's 50-50 chance you can tell. It's not 100%. Well, you can't tell if somebody is necessarily a doctor unless he's got a stethoscope. Yeah, well, I'm, 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 just, tell I'm just telling I'd you like uh, how they walk or, or uh, what, how do they walk? the language they use. Give like me for, for, okay, the walk. I mean, I'm in the show business. I'd love to be able to spot okay. him. Okay. Well, they he's going to walk with our... walk similar... Whoops. Go ahead. they got to walk similar to this here. Right? <laughs> they do. Similar to this. Similar to that. Okay. Uh, how do they dress? Uh, some of them dress flashy. Some dress like bankers. Uh, it's very hard to tell, really. Right. And my husband wore blue jeans most of the time. He wore blue jeans. That's all the time? Most of the time. Sally, I heard uh, Debbie's conversation backstage. I agree with her a thousand percent. Um, most men who I know would not tell their families what they did, especially if they were doing what her But do you understand did. why we are having a hard time with that? I mean... We live very close to our husbands. How could anybody carry on? Because you live a good life. So you live a normal life. You have a husband, you, he goes to work and comes back. Um, the thinking sometimes with mobs is now, I've locked up hundreds of them. The thinking of them is, I don't want to tell her anything. If she gets divorced from me 10 years, she's going to put me away forever. That's, that's one, well, one I happen to believe, Debbie. Thought. Precisely. And, I, happen, uh, I, I sat close to her, I looked in her eyes, and I understand the audience's feeling. But I've been doing this a long time, and it's yeah. kind of hard to... I, I have trouble thinking you could... How to, you, you, you said how they walk, yeah, how they dress. They, some of them walk like that. They're, they're uh, like I told you, uh, different stereotypes. Bankers, they look, may look like bankers. You got flashy, uh, you know, like Capone who dress... How do they, do they talk like good fellows? Yeah, in a way, yeah. And they have their own terms in, as far as, like, uh, money. Like, they, they may use a term, fazul, which means, uh, actually, in Italian, beans. Beans. Or potato. I'm serious. Potatoes. <laughs> it's funny, but that's the... Uh, or scarola. 
Lou, uh, are I'm you sure Italian? You know. Yes. Is what he's telling me the truth? Yeah. I wouldn't know it. it is? Yeah. They had nicknames. See, when I defended... Can you pick out one of them, too? Depends. It depends. I, I would call a lot of them wannabes because I had the right people who knew my family behind me. If I called up a guy to arrest him, again, I was a very tough guy. I called the guy up to lock him up. He tells me uh, he's going to kill my mother. He's going to peel the skin off a of bat. Lovely. Right? I go down and I put a shotgun in his mouth in a club that's owned by Spiro in Brooklyn, big wise guy. You put a, you would open someone's mouth and put a shotgun I in I stuck it down his mouth. He did. And I. He did. I cocked the gun barrel and he wet himself. He was, his stain was getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> Gee, I can't imagine why. Um, uh, I don't know. Do we like each other? I have nothing against anybody. No, me. Do we like each other? You and me? Yeah. Yes, very much. Good. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> John Gotti was sentenced to life. Was that fair? In my opinion, the, uh, it appeared not to be fair. He was denied his lawyer. He was denied certain witnesses who were expert on wire, you know, wiretaps. And uh, I, I really don't think he had a... A fair trial. You don't think it was fair? I, you know, I, I think this is America, and I think, uh, you know, from, uh, he's not Jack the Ripper. <laughs> oh, I don't or, know. Or, uh, I, don't, I don't know. David Berkowitz or Was whatever. it fair? Definitely not. Not fair? No way. I'm surprised to hear you say that. He, he didn't even get a, a half a fair break. Why? If you got me, take me, put me away. That was his philosophy. If you got me, put me away. But if you're going to deny me my lawyer, you're going to deny me my 11 witnesses, you're going to come in and say to somebody, this is the godfather. But he's going to have a fair trial. And the jury is sitting there watching 27 marshals with machine guns. I, I don't, I, I, you've already planted a bad decision in their heads. And I've, I've seen that done in court as I've testified in cases where they, I know that they're going to object to it, I, but I've already made a statement and they'll hear it. I'm really surprised that you're saying this. No, I can see, I could see him go to jail for a thousand years, not just life, but do it right, get him right. Ah. Yeah. You know, Lou, you know, we reap what we sow in this life. How do you think your life's going to end? Well, I'm going to make it end good. I, I, there's nobody in the world that can defeat me and my, my, you know, my inner self. I'm very happy, and I'm very, very uh, strong-minded. I could never, ever, I never bow to people. Do you have I, a conscience of what you've been doing? I mean, do you ever lose sleep at night? Oh no, not at all. What did I, he do? Uh, I did my job as, as best yeah. I could, you know, as best I could, and um, I take had a, a break. Bath. We'll be right back. Okay. And uh, I loved it. I'm, I'm really fascinated. I've been doing these shows since, gosh, Billy Friedkin and French Connection, and I'll never, and Louis the Torch. And, I, and here I am still doing them, and they never cease to fascinate me. Thank you.